Western Museum is that um, the Walters is small and the Metropolitan Museum is big. So in a way, you can see all of art, five continents, 5,000 years, in a relatively small museum. And why this happened is an odd story, an interesting story, uh, because it really depends not on a city and money so much as on an individual, a father and a son. Next image, please. Can we get the next slide or maybe I, oh, there we go. This is downtown Baltimore in the mid 19th century, 1855 to be precise. And that little blue arrow shows a townhouse and the townhouse is still there and that's where my office was. On the left, you can see the Washington Monument, um, which is the dominating uh, piece of architecture in downtown Baltimore. Anyway, in the 1850s, a young man and his wife moved into that house and he was a rising businessman. He was in his 30s, he was pretty young. Uh, and this was where all the rising businessmen of Baltimore decided to move at that time and realize that Baltimore was then the third largest city in the United States and the fastest growing city in the United States. Right now, Baltimore is probably the 25th largest city in the United States. But back then it was a booming town. Next image, please. So on the right, you see the founder of the Walters. His name was William T. Walters. He was born in 1819 and died in 1894. And he seemed to have a gift for business like a lot of 19th century Americans. He started in the liquor business and he had a rye whiskey business. And occasionally on eBay, you can find bottles of Walter's rye for sale and they cost a thousand dollars a bottle now, but in those days it was pretty cheap. And he did well at that. So then he started to buy railroads and eventually he created the Atlantic Coastline Railroad. And if you've ever played Monopoly, there are four railroads on the Monopoly board. And one of them is the Atlantic Coastline. And that's uh, a railroad that went from Baltimore all the way down to the tip of Florida. And that's where his wealth came from. And like a lot of 19th century um, major business people, he also founded a bank. So he had a place to put all of his money. Uh, things worked that way in those days. And uh, there were very few laws and very low taxes. Um, so it was a, uh, it's the great gilded age as they call it. Next image, please. Well, this man, William Walters had learned from his mother that if you are around good art, it's almost like being in a church. Art and religion were very closely related in the way he understood the world. So. In his 30s, he was 37 years old when he bought the painting on the left, which is by an American painter, Asher Durand. And it's a spectacularly beautiful painting. And he bought that painting for his house. Now the house is not very big and the painting is very big. And what that tells us is that from the very beginning, when he was still a young man, he believed that not only did art uh, bring you closer to God, it was your obligation to share that art with other people, uh, almost like a preacher would share religion. And so he bought a painting that didn't fit his house because he knew someday it would be in a museum and the whole city would benefit from it. And so when we go to the Walters, I'll show you this painting. And it's one of the most grand American paintings that exist. It's in the Catskills in New York City, New York State. It's just absolutely beautiful. The other thing he loved to collect are vases, porcelains, uh, from China and Japan. And why he hit on that, I have no idea, but he collected thousands of pieces, much like the one on the right. So his collection, by, by the time the Civil War began, his collection was very strong, very major in American paintings and in Asian pots and vases and jades and things like that. And then the Civil War came around. Next image please oh by the way before the civil war he built a teeny weeny museum I, I, when i say small it's like a double-sized garage behind his house and this is what it looked like it was so small that all his paintings had to be hung on the wall like three up and down and it must have been crazy to be in this place and it was lit by gas lights 
Uh, and um, so it was very, very crowded. And you could get into it very interestingly, as a general public could get in by giving him a quarter. And he turned this quarter over the Children's Relief Fund, uh, a fund for orphans. So he wanted the public to see it, and he didn't want to gain from that experience financially. So he gave the money to charity, which was kind of nice. But obviously, his little museum, this double or triple size garage of his, was too small. Anyway, the Civil War broke out, next image. And as you may know, uh, Maryland is south of the Mason-Dixon line. And truth to tell, uh, William T. Walters was on the side of the Confederacy. So in order not to be arrested, because his brother was arrested, he went to Paris and sat out the war. And the image on the right is the Eiffel Tower. The image on the left is a painting by a, a French artist, a famous French artist named Ang. And what Henry, what William Walters discovered was that the French were better painters than the Americans, or at least he thought they were. So he wired back to his, to his uh, lawyer to sell his American paintings because he wanted to buy French paintings. And he bought the best French paintings there were to buy. And he bought paintings after painting after painting. Next image. So he died in 1894. And he still had that teeny museum, that triple size garage. And he had a son and a daughter. And the daughter married the son's roommate from college and moved away. But the son went into the railroad business with him. And the son was every bit as good at making money as his father. Father was called William and the son was called Henry. And Henry decided after his father died that he was gonna take over and buy art from all cultures and all regions and all periods. His father, as I said, concentrated first on American paintings, then French 19th century paintings, and always on Asian decorative arts. But his son, Henry, uh, who was born in 1848, uh, bought everything he could lay his hands on. And he didn't even look at the art before he bought it. In fact, in 1902, he paid a million dollars. 1902, a million dollars is worth something like 200 million now. He paid a million dollars for 1,700 works of art that spanned two and a half centuries. He bought it from an Italian. And he had to recruit a ship to bring it all back to New York City. And he bought everything, as you can see in this picture, from Roman uh, marble tombs to the most elaborate and sumptuous jewelry made by French jewelers of, this, of the period. So he covered everything from roughly 3000 BC to 1980. And the father had bought about 5,000 works of art and his son, in his lifetime, between about 1900 and 1931, when he died, bought 15,000 works of art. So the collection was 20,000 works of art, if you can imagine that. Next one. So the son didn't have enough room at all, so he built this museum. And the museum that you enter today in Baltimore, the one we will go into, was built in 1909. And you can see what the installation on the right looked like. It was just packed with things. Again, uh, 20,000 works of art. He couldn't even keep track of them. Many of them he'd never seen when he bought them. And he bought, he, he would spend like a million dollars a year. And that's in today's dollars, as I say, more than a hundred million dollars. There was nobody at the time that was buying more art faster than Henry Walters. Uh, next slide. So Henry Walters died in 1931 at the age of 83. And by the way, he lived in New York City where his business was. He didn't live in Baltimore, but he loved Baltimore. And he, every work of art he bought for the museum, he bought in honor of his father. Because the whole idea was to complete the work that his father had begun by buying works from all great cultures in the past. So when he died in 1931, there were 250 crates as you can see, one of them at the lower left there with his initials, HR, Henry Walters. 250 crates in, in the sculpture court, in the courtyard of the museum that had never been opened. Art crates
weeks of art that he, that when he died, had been shipped to Baltimore, but nobody had had time even to look inside the boxes. And among the things that were in those boxes were two Fabergé eggs. And these are the most exquisite things that were made in the Russian court in the early 20th century, right before the Bolshevik Revolution. Only 50 of them were ever made, and Walters bought two of them right before he died. And right now they're probably worth $20 million a piece because they're so rare and so beautifully done. So we'll take a look at those when we go. Next slide. So when he died in 1931, he, he had written a will and the will was open and it said, I give my whole collection, 20,000 works of art, my museum, which was a private museum up till that point, to the city of Baltimore for the benefit of the public. Well, there were two problems. One, the city didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and two, nobody knew what the objects were. So they had, to, the city was wise enough to hire some curators and conservators, people that took care of the art and studied the art on the left, and a form an education department who, whose business it was to try to make the art meaningful for the city. And you see on the right, one of the early educators at the Walters on television, one of the first uh, educators in an art museum to go on television to carry the collection to the public. And that's been defining of the Walters ever since it opened to the public in 1934. Next slide. So when we go to the Walters, you'll see something kind of odd. You won't know it's odd, but I'll tell you it's odd. So we had 20,000 works of art. And what we did was to combine them into historical scenes. You know, he, uh, this is a mummy. Uh, there the mummy is on the left, an Egyptian mummy, <clears throat> about 3,000 year old mummy. And there's a real body inside there, it's a woman. And you can look at the mummy as, as you did on the left and you may or may not get make any sense of it. But what we did was, we sifted through the entire collection and found things that would go with the mummy. And that's how the museum now presents the collection, by putting together things that were bought at different times, in different places, putting them back together again as they would have been in the past. So on the right, you see that same mummy, and you see those four little statue things, they're jars actually, and they're called canopic jars, and the the, the organs of the decedent, the organs of the mummified person would go into those. So one would have the heart, one would have the lungs, one would have the intestines, one would have the kidneys. I'm not sure what all was in those things. And then <clears throat> the little box on the left is filled with little wooden, little wooden dolls. They look like dolls. And these little wooden doll things are what took care of the mummy in the afterlife. They bring him food and you know, find his pillow and things like that. So when you go to the museum, it's like going back in time. It's kind of a magical trip back to ancient Egypt. So you don't just see, see things, you see things that are put together in groups. Next slide. And the most elaborate one, and we're the only museum in the world that has one of these, uh, is called a Cabinet of Wonders. And this is worth the trip all by itself. And the Cabinet of Wonders is a recreation of what museums were like 400 years ago. Uh, when, when moose heads and flying red squirrels and snakes and Egyptian mummies and paintings and butterflies and snails and beetles were all collected because they were all interesting. And people who love to collect would collect all of these things. So that room is like walking back in time to 1650, to the lifetime of Rembrandt. And the, it started with an alligator. We have a fully stuffed, huge alligator in that room that was shot in Florida by one of the trustees of the Walters. At the other end of the room, we have a moose head. Halfway down the hall, we have a, a, um, a sawtooth from, the, from a sawtooth tiger. And uh, there's all, kind, all kinds of wonderful things. And in it are 
is rock crystal, you know, this kind of rock that you can see through. But then we also have rock crystal that's been carved into works of art because they believed that God had given the world magical materials and artists could turn those materials into even more powerful and wonderful things. So when we go to the Walters, we'll see all of that and, uh, and remind me to point out the alligator when we get there. And that is kind of the background of the story that I will continue when we meet at the Walters. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing that makes the Walters a little different from other museums is that it's free. Uh, when Henry Walters died, as I said, he said the museum should be for the benefit of the public. So that more than 10 years ago, I decided we couldn't be for the benefit of the public if we charge people to see things that belong to them. He'd given them the collection. It belongs to, to the people. It belongs to you. And so anything we charge is creating a kind of a barrier or a wall that separates you from the stuff that you own. So we went free. And it's been a great part of what the museum is now about. Next one. And the other thing we did um, was to put the collection on the internet so that if you lived in Florida or California or Paris, you could visit the Walters by seeing images of the collection. And we don't charge anything. And if you want to take that image and print it on your t-shirt, uh, that's just fine. Or make a nice photo enlargement and frame it and put it on your wall. That's all the better because we feel that if the collection belongs to the people, pictures of the collection should also belong to the people. And it also should be for free. And we were one of the first museums in the country to put our collection online and make it accessible to everybody. Next one. So that's the end, but not the end because we're all gonna meet and take a walk through this wonderful place and see some really dazzling things close up in the not too distant future. I hope we can do it like in October or something like that. So now what questions do you have for me? Stacy, do you wanna unmute everybody? I'm not gonna so. unmute everybody, but if you have a question that you wanna share, will you raise your hand? Um, that way we can still hear responses. Okay, I'm gonna, Beirut, why don't you go first? And then Have Christopher. Art. Have Chinese or Asian art? Can you ask it again, Beirut? I didn't hear you. Does the Walters Art Museum have any Chinese or any Asian art? Oh, yeah, okay. good question. Yes, we do. We have lots of oh. Asian art. And again, it's mostly um, ceramics, vases, things like that. Almost no painting. I'm not sure why it was that Walters didn't buy Chinese paintings or Japanese paintings because they're wonderful. But instead he bought Chinese um, jade and Japanese um, ceramics and Japanese uh, uh, pottery and things like that. So it's a, it's a huge collection of, of that know. kind of Asian material. And let's see, what else do we have from Asia? Oh, we have a wonderful collection from Thailand. And these are mostly bronze Buddhas, and they're really amazing, I have to say, quite wonderful. Um, so yeah, it's a very good Asian collection as well. Thank, Thank you, you. Beirut. I'm gonna um, ask Christopher to go next, and then Al, you can be right after that. Okay. Go ahead, Christopher. Okay. When exactly did, did Mr. Walters start collecting? The father started collecting in uh, actually about 1857. At that point, he was 38 years old. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it's quite amazing for, and again, he was in the liquor business. So at, in the daytime, he would, he would bottle booze. And then when he was done, he would get in touch with people to sell him art. And somehow, as I said, his mother thought that if you had art around you, it, literally what he said, you were half a Christian. And I'm not sure exactly how to understand that, but it meant that 
you were getting closer to God if you were looking at art. And, and that's, I think, what he believed. I don't know if his son believed that so much, but the father certainly did. <laughs> cool. Great question, Christopher. Al, I'm going to yeah, unmute you. you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, Al, you're oh. unmuted. We can hear you now. You're good. Uh, do you have an armor? Uh, amen. Armor. Amen. Armor. Armor? Yes. Yes, yes we do. Nice. In fact, you remember that room that has the alligator in it there? Yeah. Well, the room right before the alligator is filled with armor. It's not a huge collection, but it's a very good collection. And my favorite piece in that is called a uh, gun shield, gun shield. And it's a combination of a pistol and a shield, a round shield. And the pistol is right in the middle of the shield. And it comes from England and it's about uh, 400 years old. And the idea was you could shoot the gun and somehow you were protected by the shield. Well, it was only good as long as somebody else didn't have exactly the same thing. Because <laughs> if they shot back at you, uh, you were in big trouble. But if they tried to, you know, do an, shoot, shoot an arrow at you or perhaps a big sword, the shield would, would provide some, some protection. So it's a very odd piece of military hardware that lasted all of 20 years in history. They're very rare. The other thing I love in that is a double-handed sword. And a double-handed sword is a sword that's so big, you can't lift it with one hand. You have to use two hands. Wow. And we installed it right over the door that leads from the little room of armor into the room with the alligator in it. In fact, if you look at the alligator before you go into the room and then look up, you can see the sword right above your head. So I thought it was kind of funny to put the sword right above your head as you're <laughs> looking at the uh, dead alligator. <laughs> that must have been fun to conceptualize. Oh, I love that. Put together. I'm going to call on Fayemi next and then Nadia. Hi, Fayami. What, uh, will you take your mask off if it's, if it's safe so we can hear you better? Growing what do you up, want to share? The question and the ability of the mask. Now, train a goat farm to match his gift. To save you from every town and the future all the same time. From every town. Okay, Fayami, hold on one second. I'm having a really hard time hearing you. Did you ask about training? Yes. Do you want to know about Gary's training? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, there is no place you go to learn how to be a museum director. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I went to college and studied art history um, simply because I was good at it. Uh, I, I was good at remembering pictures and uh, so that's what made me do that. And I kept doing it <clears throat> all through a PhD. And when I received my PhD, now it's uh, 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, um, I couldn't find a job. And so, and I wasn't alone. There were too many PhDs in art history and too few positions in universities. So I kind of stumbled into museum work. I liked it because I like to bring um, what I think I know about art to a wide audience. Um, if you're in a university, you talk to your students and you write for other university professors. And, uh, and that's fine, but I like being involved with the public and trying to make some sense out of the art for for the public. It was just, I'm from Minnesota, maybe that's it, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But yeah, most, pe most people in museums, at least of my age, uh, didn't plan on ending up there. So interesting, Gary. Nadia has a question. Nadia, I'm going to unmute you. 
Y'all are asking really good questions. No. <laughs> um, and then, Corey, did, do you have a question after Nadia? I don't know if he's waving to us or his friend. All right, Nadia, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Did um, Walters went to travel to Egypt when he was alive to get the the month uh, to get the stuff from Egypt? Excellent question. Get... Uh, yes and no. He traveled to Egypt as a tourist. Uh, oh. He had he had a yacht that was 220 feet long. It had um, a steam engine, but it also had enormous sails. So, and a crew of 15. So the yacht would be taken to Europe um, from New York, where he had it most of the time. And he would take a, a passenger liner ship to Europe, meet up with the yacht, and he would take it to St. Petersburg, he would take it to, Rome, he would take it to Egypt, and he went up the Nile on this boat. But he didn't buy anything Egyptian. And he, we have a great Egyptian collection, but he bought it in Paris. Oh, okay. He bought it in Paris from an Armenian dealer. So if that all makes any sense, that's the way the world used to work. <laughs> okay, because my, um, my, my dad's from Egypt, so it, it's just fascinating to see all those Egyptian artifacts. Oh, it is indeed. And when I've been to Egypt a couple of times, and <laughs> I, I know exactly where some of his things came from. The mummy yeah. comes from right near the temple of the, of the woman pharaoh, Hatshepsut, if I, I'm not pronouncing the name correctly. Yeah, I won't say the name because my dad will pronounce it correctly. <laughs> but but I, you know, I can see in my mind's eye, I can see exactly the hillside where, that, where we know that coffin came from. He has one of the best collections in the world of Egyptian bronzes. Mm. And we know exactly where they came from. Now, <laughs> nowadays you can't do that. You can't buy Egyptian art anymore. Um, Egypt won't let, won't, won't let that happen and that's just fine. But when he bought in 1915, it was all fine. Uh, Egypt was well aware of what was going on and they had no quarrel with it. So, uh, but we don't have any big things. You know, oh, okay. we were shipping this back on this boat. So, you know, your 5,000 pound lion and granite would not do well. So right. the Walters collection is mostly of small Egyptian pieces. Do you have any um, information I can look up to send to my parents? To... Yeah, just go online. Okay. Wal Thewalters.org and uh, and go to the Egyptian, go to the collection and just go to Egypt. There's probably one heading in the search engine for Egypt and you'll see, you'll see wonderful things and send them a couple pictures and, and uh, uh, there may even be a general description of the Egyptian collection, but, but, okay. uh, but again, what we did when you go there, you'll see that we've arranged the material as if first you enter a temple. Uh huh. And we have two Sakmets, these enormous lion headed um, goddesses that Walters didn't buy. We borrowed mm -hmm. them from the British Museum because they have extra ones. Uh. And then you, you go through a fairly small door, and then there's all the stuff that would have been in an Egyptian temple of probably 800 BC or something like that. Oh, and then, okay. it, then you go into yeah. a tomb area, and then you go in an area with some king statues. Some of the statuary, some of the portraits of kings are astoundingly good because, you know, he didn't, he wasn't an archaeologist. He didn't care mm -hmm. about dates. What he right. loved were beautiful objects. And so some of his Egyptian pieces are just astoundingly good. Good, good. Thank you for the information. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Nadia. Sure, sure. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for Gary? You can raise your hand and we can unmute you if you have something you want to ask. I see Fayemi. You asked, a, I'm going to unmute you, Fayemi. Try and get a little closer to the screen so we can try and hear what you're saying. Hi, Hi. Fayemi. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Hi. Do you want to ask Gary a question? 
What do the questions have meaning to you for Madeline? Madeline. Madeline? Because yeah. we've been talking about Paris in the chat. So maybe oh, yeah. you're thinking about Madeline, the, oh, yes. the, the, the literary the figure. An old house in Paris all covered with vines. Where yes. Down yeah, down that's Madeline. my favorite. <laughs> Uh, last chance for any other questions, you guys. Oh, Sija. Hey, how are you? Hey, did I say it right this time? Sija, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, Gary, um, you know, the news about, like, um, challenging for people who had to travel to Europe since pandemic is because, you know, um, I have saw my friend uh, um, who went to Europe to study abroad, uh, um, like, in early 2020, but it's but all of a sudden they had to, uh, they end up returning to the United States when it's there. But, you know, this is like the, you know, basically challenging, you know, but I know Europe is a very cool place, as you know, but I haven't been there before. But um, anyway, um, I, last year I went to the, the beautiful island of the National Park and the Zion National Park because this is like, you know, pretty cool adventurous place, you know. But, you know, the thing is that, you know, when people experience like, you know, beautiful nature, you know, it's like a wonderful right. place, you know, but, you know, during a pandemic, it's just that, you know, they tried to reopen, but, you know, they still had to limit some of the visitors, uh, whether they visit uh, anywhere across the national park, you know. Sija, do you have a question about Gary or his presentation? Uh, sorry, I came a little late. So what's the presentation looks like? Well, we can share uh, well, some of the recording with you. We'll do that later. <laughs> Is that no, okay? Uh, to, to the point of the uh, of nature, um, the painting I showed at the beginning or near the beginning uh, was the first paint major painting uh, William Walters bought is of the Catskills in New York. And it's like going to a national park. And I think in a way, for him, it was not only a great work of art, it took him into nature. And um, I think he must have believed, I don't know this, but that going to a national park or being in nature was much like being around a work of art. And when you have a work of art that takes you uh, to nature, then I think you've struck the jackpot. Thank you, Gary. Um, Marianne, you have a question for yeah, Gary? I just wanted to know, Gary, if you could tell us a little bit about your French collection. Uh, the French collection um, is spectacular. Yes, sir. And when people think of French art, they may think of, uh, they mostly think of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist art. Well, in fact, the father and the son Walters just didn't like it. I don't know why. <laughs> they, they could have bought it. They didn't. They bought some. And well, the collection of impressions are, is small, but it's very good. But the real amazing part of the Walters collection when it comes to French art really is the 19th century paintings like the one I showed by Anne. And these are, these are academic, what we call academic paintings. And they're not done in nature, they're done in a studio. And they're done, the subject matter might be from the Bible or from classical mythology, but it's not looking out at nature as Monet did or at a mountain as Cezanne did. Uh, and Walters liked the precision and the kind of intellectual accuracy maybe of these kinds of works of art. So uh, if you go to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, which which is a spectacular museum. And the ground floor of that is like being at a big version of the Walters uh, because upstairs is where all the impressionists, most of the impressionist art is. But downstairs, fewer people, so it's sort of nice. It's where the academic paintings are and they're really, really good. Walters also had superb um, French ceramics of the 18th century. Um, and French paintings of the 18th century. And what may surprise you <clears throat> is their French medieval manuscripts. And by the way, manuscripts that were made of animal skins. Um, 
went out of fashion when Gutenberg invented movable type. So they stopped being made around 1500. But in the last century before that, there were thousands that were made for private use. And uh, the most common one was called a book of hours. And this is a prayer book. It's not like a Bible exactly. And not uh, like it's certainly not the Old Testament, but these are sections of the Bible that are organized to guide you in your prayers every day of the week at home not in church, at home. And they're very, for wealthy people, they were very fancy and they have pictures in them and they have decoration and the script is amazing. Well, in all the world, nobody made more of these in a better way than the French in the 15th century. And strangely enough, there are more books of ours that are French in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore than in all the libraries and museums of Paris combined. Wow. That is, now, <laughs> it's, it's not everybody's taste. These books are small. You have to look at them really close to get them. They're beautiful, uh, but they're hard to see. And so the public is not so aware. And by the way, they're so fragile. We can only show a few at a time. So most of them are tucked away in the library. But that's really where the strength of the collection begins. But now that I think about it, it's a good question. Uh, the Walters has spectacular French medieval art, sculpture, uh, enamels, French enamels of the Middle Ages, um, as good as anything the Met has in New York City. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, thank hey. you. It's fun to, uh, to reminisce. Yeah. Marian, do you want to um, yeah. launch our poll and do our little wrap up about what's coming up? Session. There it is, everybody, for you. Um, what do we have coming up? We have this afternoon, Sharon is baking again. It's her famous chocolate chip cookies, you guys. Yay. They are so good. Matthew, are you going to bake? It looks like Al's interested. Faith Yay. is definitely going to be there. Corey, tomorrow, are you going to bake? Tomorrow we have um, a place to a I'll space try, to belong. Yes. We have yoga. What else do we do? Do we have anything Sunday? We don't yeah, have it's bingo this Sunday. Bingo this Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so excited. Hold <laughs> the Amazon gift card again. Yeah, maybe you will. Maybe you will. Oh, I'll see you, everyone. Yeah, if you have to pop off, go ahead. If you still have to answer our question in the poll, please do. And you feel free to add into the chat any other feedback or comments you want to share with us about um, Gary's presentation today. Gary, thank you so very much. Well, it's a great wanna, audience. Yeah, That's they're awesome. Rare. Guys, I also want to let you know that next week um, for Culture Series, Gary and I have a mutual friend. Her name is Lauren Latessa, and she's a professional cellist. And she is coming on to not only play music for us, but we're also going to have a conversation about music and emotion. Um, and it's going to be really interactive. We're going to get to listen to music. I think we are also going to do a little bit of drawing or writing. So come prepared with paper and a pencil. Um, and I'm really excited. I want you guys to get to know Lauren. Um, because she's amazing and she may be doing some concerts for us with her group called the Iris Music Trio. Ooh. Yeah, so it's- I can't Darius. wait, Stacey. Oh, yay, I'm so glad. Um, but this was great. Today was so interesting for me. I, I know, loved, I can't wait, I can't wait to go in person. Are. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll see you guys around. Okay, Thank bye, you, Christopher. Bye, we'll see everyone. you. Bye. Thank you. See everyone bye -bye. for breaking. Bye. Bye, bye. bye. Thank you. everyone around. Bye. Bye. Bye, Robert. Robert, I'll be in touch. <laughs> uh, did, Stacey, you see what, was... did you see uh, what Christopher was... wrote? The presentation was great. I was floored. The art was beautiful. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was yeah, amazing. Yeah, Sisha, what's your question? Well, the thing, well, the question is about that, you know, I was supposed to have an appointment for a Main Street apartment, uh -huh. but the thing is that I haven't heard back. 
Oh, they are so busy, Sija. Don't stress too much about it. Um, I would try and call them again. Did you have an appointment scheduled or not well, yet? Well, I was, I was supposed to, it was June 30th, but I didn't hear back. Yeah, we don't have any of those answers. It's only the property management company, Hercules, that can help you. So you need to be patient and persevere. Follow up, continue to follow up with them as best you can. I'm sorry. It's hard. Oh, uh, yeah, but I just heard 